Hi there, this is Pastor Julie from the United Methodist Churches of Shoto, Brady, and Dutton, Montana. Welcome. We are glad to have you join us online or through our podcast. We would love to have you worship with us live or in person any Sunday. For more information on our locations and worship times, I'd invite you to check out our website, umshoto.net. And be sure to follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shotoumc. Thanks for joining us from wherever you are in the world. Since we are doing Sunday School Stories today, I'm going to take you all back to your childhood, and we are going to watch a short little movie here on Jonah and the Big Fish before we get to our scripture reading. Heroes of the Bible, Jonah. This is Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. That means it was his job to tell people what God told him to say. One day, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh because the people of Nineveh were doing bad things. But instead, Jonah ran away. Where did you see? and went to the port to board a ship. Going the other way, he was hoping to get away from God. He sailed for a place called Tarshish. While he was at sea, God sent a great and powerful wind over the sea that caused a storm that seemed like it would break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the sailors tried everything they could think of to save the ship. Meanwhile, Jonah was sound asleep, so the captain went down and said, How can you sleep at a time like this? Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will help us. Then the crew figured out that Jonah was the reason for the storm. Uh, uh And they asked him, Who are you? Why is this happening to us? Jonah told them who he was and that he worshipped the one true God who made the sea. Then he told the sailors to throw him in the sea so the storm would stop. No, why? The sailors still tried to escape the storm, but it was no use. Uh... So they asked God for forgiveness and threw Jonah into the sea. The storm stopped at once. Whoa. The sailors were amazed at God's power and they vowed to serve him. Now God sent a great fish to swallow Jonah. Uh, And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and nights. Jonah prayed to God from inside the fish and God ordered the fish to spit Jonah out. Uh, God told Jonah again to go to the city of Nineveh to tell them what God had said about them. This time, Jonah obeyed God and went to Nineveh to deliver God's message. (coughs) The people of Nineveh stopped doing bad things and turned to God. They were saved because they listened to the message that God had given Jonah. Al comes up to read our scripture reading, I feel like it's a proper time to say, and now for the rest of the story. Reading is from Jonah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? When Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there, 
He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. We have several teachers and staff members in our congregations that are looking forward to, well, maybe you're looking forward, I guess, to beginning a new school year. Maybe you're looking forward to a few more weeks of having a little break. But either way, I found a little story about a high school principal starting out on his first year at a new school. And um, this high school principal asked all of his teachers to write down their resolutions their new year resolutions for the new school year. And then he was going to put them all up on a bulletin board. So obviously principals don't always put a whole lot of effort into creating the bulletin board. So the teachers were really excited about this and they did exactly what he had asked. And after the bulletin board was complete, they all gathered around and were reading through and suddenly there was a lot of commotion that the principal heard from his office. So he came out to see what was going on one of the teachers was really upset. She said, how come mine isn't up there? I wrote them all down. Why'd you leave me out? What was wrong with mine? And he's like, sure, it was an honest honest mistake. Let me go back and see if it's on my desk. And yes, it was. It was laying there. So principal picks it up and he begins skimming through what she had written down. The very first resolution was to not let things upset her in this new school year. Two-year-olds are not the only ones who throw temper tantrums. I'm guilty of it. I'm sure all of you have thrown tantrums at different times. Sometimes we let little things upset us. And we react in ways that probably aren't the best. Things that, ways that we shouldn't really be reacting to a very small situation. Sometimes though, As adults, when we have temper tantrums, they can be over big issues. And when that happens, they're what I kind of call a spiritual temper tantrum. We often think that it's really, really great when God offers his grace and his love to those people that we like and that we enjoy being around. However, when he saves those people or shows love and grace to those people who are less desirable in our opinion. We assume that God forgives them and gives them some love, but they're still just there, surrounded in their sin, just sitting, that nothing has really changed. I've been seeing a lot of posts on Facebook this week that ironically have brought a lot of anger to my heart. Not anger at God, but anger in people who are very, very much like me. Christian women who have a strong faith. They look like me. They act like me. They are being very less desirable, in my opinion, judging other people. And as I began reflecting on Jonah's story this week, my response that I wanted to shout so much at them was, stop being like Jonah. So I want to go through this chapter a little more in depth and tell you what I mean. At the beginning, 
of this fourth chapter of Jonah. Jonah, by the way, the whole book of Jonah is very short. You could pull it out and read it in less than five minutes easy. It's only four, ver or four chapters. Each chapter is relatively short. But there's a lot that happens in this story of Jonah. Usually, we get that version of this video that we watched earlier. That's the childhood version that we usually know. Here's Jonah. God calls him. Jonah doesn't want to go. He ends up on a boat going the other way. He gets thrown overboard. He ends up in the belly of a big fish. He has this wonderful faith. He gets out of the fish. He goes back to Nineveh. He preaches the good word, and it actually works every preacher's dream. They listen to him. They do exactly what he's saying, what the Spirit has told him to say, and they're all saved. Yay, the end. But the thing is, that's not the end. There's a fourth chapter of Jonah, and sometimes we leave that out. So although Jonah's preaching and teaching had been well-received, Jonah gets back, and he's very upset very, very upset. So much so that he ends up going on and telling God, you know, I knew that it was going to be this way. I knew that you were going to be at work in these people's lives, but these are bad people and I didn't want to go there. And so that's why I ran away to begin with. So now since I came and then now you're loving these people, I still think that they're bad. I don't think they deserve your love and grace. And so I don't want to go back to my own people. I might as well just die. I'm better off dead than I am alive. As I read through the opinions of what some other pastors and different scholars thought about that, general consensus was that Jonah most likely didn't want to return to his own people because he didn't want the words and the accusations of him being amongst these people of Nineveh. The Israelite people and the people of Nineveh were very much at odds with each other. They, he didn't want his parents and his grandparents judging him for being in among these people who were full of sin and talking about God with them because they weren't worthy of God's love, at least in their opinion. So then Jonah begins praying to God, and God ends up giving him this bush is what our scripture reading says. Some of the scriptures translate it into a tree. I view it kind of as a jack in the beanstalk type thing. This huge plant ends up growing up. It's planted overnight. It grows up and it provides him this wonderful shade. And Jonah's sitting under there enjoying the shade. Very comfortable. And then along comes a worm that it says got a point. A point. This worm eats the tree or the bush and it kills it. So the next day, Jonah is then out there just scorching in the heat. We can all kind of relate to that over the last couple of weeks. A lot of us don't have AC, and we can try to open our windows, but the heat just continues to make us feel miserable. That's the point that Jonah was at. He was under the heat. He was miserable, and he begins praying to God. And God ends up having kind of this dialogue with him, and he says, why are you so upset? Do you really have any reason to be angry? And also, why are you so concerned about this bush or this tree? Why are you so upset over this plant? It's not like you cultivated the plant and watered it and nurtured it to make it grow. Why are you so upset it's gone? It wasn't yours to be grieving. And then go, God goes on to tell Jonah, it's the same way to these people in Nineveh. They are not yours to judge. They are not yours to be angry about. They are not your people to decide how they are sinning. I'm the one that created them. I'm the one that loved them. I am the one that nurtured them. You had one job to go and talk to them about me, your God. And you shouldn't be concerned with the rest of it. I was reading through, like I said, some different dialects or dialogues of what other pastors and what commentary said about this scripture. And one of them that really stuck out to me about this was he said, when we get mad 
at God's people or when we get angry at God, it has the same effect as if we sit and beat our head on a wall. It does absolutely no good and all that it does is cause hurt. When I first read that, I kind of pushed it aside because it was a Southern Baptist pastor that said it. And I learned a quick lesson in my own self not to judge Southern Baptist pastors because I really like his point on what he said. Now the reason I judge the Southern Baptist pastor is because I'm usually on defense because Southern Baptist pastors judge me as a female pastor. So I was kind of at odds. Well, this is the same thing that was going on as Jonah and these people of Nineveh. They didn't see eye to eye at all. But God pointed out it was not Jonah's place to judge them or decide. I mentioned to you that there were several things on Facebook that I saw over this past week that got me really fueled with anger. And I have to admit, I had to say some prayers this morning that God was not going to let me get up here and angry preach about these topics because they really did get a fire going under me. But it was enough that I felt like it was something I needed to mention. It was one of those things that I couldn't just brush aside. So all of these wonderful pages of outline notes, I'm done using them for now. (laughs) Two huge topics over this last week that stood out to me are probably two topics that are going to get your blood boiling, okay? And I'm not trying to inflict anger in you, but I want to use them as an example on how they relate to our real life. One of them is abortion, and one of them is homosexuality. In Kansas, you all know that's my home state and where I'm from. They just passed a huge bill this last week. They voted no. No to the state being able to set in any type of restrictions on abortion. They said that all people were going to be able to receive the care that they needed to see. One of my very dear friends, a lifelong friend from my childhood, posted a picture on Facebook that said our salvation came from an unexpected pregnancy. And she was using that in her defense that the state had got it very wrong and that they should have voted yes, that abortion should not be legal and that the government should be involved. I hold my own very personal beliefs on abortion, and I'm sure all of you do too, and I'm sure that all of our views are very, very, very strong. We get those views and those beliefs because of what we have been taught from our Sunday school classes, from our church, from our parents, from our society, our culture that we live in. But it does not mean that our views are 100% right and somebody else's are 100% wrong. And it is not our place at all to judge another human being. We have no idea what the relationship is like with God. It is not our place to make choices for them or to dictate what happens in their life. And we can't assume that just because they say I'm a Christian, that they're over here somehow less holy than we are because they're still living in what we view as sin. So it irritated me that she had posted this. Yeah, maybe Jesus did come from an unplanned pregnancy. But there's some planned pregnancies that brought up some really bad people. There is, this wasn't what the issue was about. It wasn't about unplanned pregnancy. And the words that she was sharing in the debate and the comments, I kind of wanted to get some popcorn and just sit there and read them. The things that were happening in those comments were heartbreaking. They were so hateful to each other. And that is not what we are supposed to do as Christians. Now, the other Facebook post that really got me going this week, I'm sure that several of you have seen it, but it's, a post that multiple people are sharing and it says, I feel sad for parents these day because today because they have to explain to their children not just the birds and the bees, but they have to explain the bees and the beads and the birds and the birds and why some bees are birds and why some birds want to be bees and yada, yada, yada. And I sat there 
And I wanted to cry that this was the thing that Christian people, these people that shared this, I know are very devout Christians. It made me so upset that this was the judgment they were passing on. I don't care where you sit in homosexuality, you are not supposed to judge another person's life. At all. It is not up to you. You are supposed to love one another. And that is what Christ says. And the reason I think that that got me so upset, just that one little post, was because I felt attacked from mom. This is me setting apart the pastor side of me and the mother part of me. If I could set out one single goal for my relationship with all five of my children, it would be that they can come to me for absolutely anything that they have questions about. That they can talk to me about somebody who is different than them and we can talk through it and they know that it is a safe place, that they are loved 110% unconditionally. And that I will never, ever judge them. It's not sad to me that parents have to explain the real world to their children. I celebrate that parents are finally talking to their children instead of trying to shove stuff in a closet and act like it doesn't exist. This story of Jonah, it is a powerful story. The first three chapters of Jonah, they're fun and I'm I love teaching those to Sunday school kids. I love talking about that story of Jonah and the fish and did it really happen and was it well and that's all fun. But to me, the real point of the book of Jonah is this fourth chapter. It's the rest of the story, the part that we are really supposed to unpack. And I believe that God comes to us and says, why are you so concerned with them? You didn't create that group of people. You don't even know them. You've never had a conversation with them to get to know them or understand their views. You just assume that the way that they're living their life is wrong. Right before I came into church this morning, I was getting ready to start our live stream, and I was scrolling through, and I saw another Facebook post that I was like, Man, I wish I would have seen this before because I would have put it up on a slide. It said, do unto others downstream as you would have those upstream do unto you. And that really stuck out to me. It stuck out to me a lot because there are Christians that I strive to be like, people who are wonderful role models, and I would hope that they treat me in love and generosity. These are people like my bishop, the DSs, ones that I really look up to as wonderful Christian leaders and people who I strive to do a good job as a pastor for. And I would hope that they would treat me with the love and respect that I expect that they would. But it's my job to also treat all these other people downstream with that same type of love and respect without any judgment at all. There were a few scriptures that stuck out to me this week about God loving all of his children. Can anybody guess what the first one would be? It's the most popular scripture in the world. Anybody have any idea? John 3.16. I'm going to look for it as we're going through here because I don't need my notes on that one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish and would have everlasting life. God loves everyone, the whole world. And that scripture is so easy for us to quote because we all know it, that sometimes we don't live into it and remember that God loves the whole world, not just the parts that we like. God loves the whole world and he saved everyone. To take that just a little bit farther, there were a couple other scriptures that stuck out to me. This one is Matthew 9 and verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. God knows that without him, we are lost and we are helpless. 
He knows that without him, we will perish. And he knows that without the Holy Spirit in our lives, we become spiritually bankrupt. God sends people into our lives to love us. They might come from another place. They might be very different from us. God also might send us to Nineveh. The other scripture that really stuck out to me was 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. We love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love a God whom we cannot see? The scripture is pretty straightforward. Sometimes it's a big hit to our spiritual being. We can sit up here and I can stand up here and say, I absolutely love God, but if I am judging a group of people because I don't think they love God like me or they're not worthy of God's love because of what I think they're doing in their life, then I'm a liar for saying that I love God because to truly, truly love God, it means that you love every one of your Christian brothers and sisters. That is what God told us to do. The truth is that God's grace is for everyone. God gives his grace to whomever he chooses, not who we choose. We don't get to pick and choose who gets God's grace. God gives us grace and mercy because he loves us. All of humanity. Are you concerned for those around you? Are you sharing Christ's love with everyone that you come in contact with, regardless of how much you like them? If not, then you might be having a spiritual temper tantrum. We don't get to choose which one of God's people we love. We are called to love them all. this time of our service, we prepare for probably the best thing that we could do following a message on loving each other, and that's to join in Holy Communion. And we don't just join in communion with us here in this sanctuary, but we are joined with brothers and sisters throughout the entire world. And so when I get to the point of the words of institution, I hope that you will really listen to them because God wasn't just speaking them to me or to you. He was speaking them to all. Let's join together in singing, let us break bread together. Let us praise 
God together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, oh Lord, have mercy on